Hello. So um, you can stay on for a second, or we have about five minutes before we start. Okay. Um, you sounded like really muffled. Okay, you sound good now. It sounded you sounded like you're a robot. Yeah. Oh no, that's so weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you sound normal. <laughs> but if something if something happens crazy, let me know. Sometimes I forget the audio and all that good stuff. Yeah, but people will be jumping on and this part of it will be in their recordings as well. So FYI. <laughs> I won't curse. Okay, good. <clears throat> I literally just got home. Oh, yeah? Oh, my gosh. 12 hours on the airplane. Yeah. Yep. But thank you for doing this. We appreciate no, it. No, this is great. No, I, love, <laughs> I love your platform. Yeah. Everybody will be jumping in. I normally try to have commercials, but, um, you know, there's so much compliance going on that the commercials that I had, I had to, like, take them off and redo them. And I'm like, oh, I forgot. <laughs> uh, com com really like compliance like like your your company's compliance department yes which is also under the the real life compliance uh of our our regulatory agency so basically i was uh i was almost making it um i i just did something that they didn't care for so in my commercial so uh i'll redo them we have so much great content i can redo commercials i i call them the business prevention unit this is business the prevention unit <laughs> Uh, the life changers prevention units. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised. Depending on which bank you're at, um, obviously, when I, you know, when I started my career, I was at uh, um, Barclays Capital, which is the investment banking arm of Barclays Bank, and uh, uh -huh. it was kind of the Wild West back then. So you just pretty much you created your own derivative products. If you could build it into a spreadsheet, you could trade it. Oh no. No, 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 <laughs> no really? And then if I think by the time I got to BNP, which is, is you know one of the world's biggest banks, it's a French French investment bank. Um it was just uh you know, they, they wielded so much power. There was there was pre committees to, to the subcommittee and subcommittee to the committee and committee to the post committee before you could do anything. So Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's uh, and we have some people coming in too, so uh, we'll have more in like literally two minutes. Okay. Uh, and what did you think of the elections yesterday? Did we talk about? You it? Know, I, 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 was, I was in London, so I, I still haven't um, I haven't gotten all the results. Really, I, I know no one has the overall <laughs> Senate number. Um, was, but then did. did did they decide on the mayor of LA? They have not decided on the mayor of LA as far as I know just yet. Mm. We don't know. It, it's it's it must be neck and neck. But you know something uh, so interesting is um, apparently the the two con of the two contenders. One of them invested a hundred million dollars, and in his campaign, at least that's what I heard. And I'm oh. like, I'm like, well. If you invested a hundred million dollar, what's your return? Because I'm sure you're getting some way to return. Well, th that was always the question, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> what's your rate of return? What you getting, and where's it coming from? <laughs> all, all this homeless housing that he's going to build. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, but he is a real estate developer. So. Oh, he is a real estate developer. That makes sense. That's because I'm, I'm just like, no, you're a businessman. There's some, there's a rate of return. You you don't even know how to function without some sort of ROI, you know? Yeah, so. I, I think some of it's ego. Um, you know, when you're so successful and you, these billionaires, um, mm -hmm. where it stops being usually the scorecards money, right? Yeah. Usually. But at some point, it stops being money and just it's just ego. And hey, I could be president or I could be mayor of Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? I wish the scorecard was changing the world, changing communities, eliminating poverty, eliminating um, hunger. I wish that was the scorecard. I wish. I wish too. We have the resources. <laughs> That'd be a better scorecard. Yeah. No, we have the resources. We just. Yeah, it's just like, you know, I guess we could talk about this as, yeah. as far as social change, social justice. Um, 
you know, obviously police brutality is very, yeah, very important. Well, fighting it is very important to me. It, for, to us, to black it, folks, not necessarily to anybody else, let the numbers show. Right, <laughs> right. And, you know, people say that the, you know, the system's broken. I mean, it's not broken. It's working exactly how it was, it was meant to work. Yeah. And same thing with, with poverty and, and, you know, if they wanted to yeah. fix it. They, they could, but we had the resources. But, but it's it's really unfortunate because the reality is we would be a much better civilization and world and earth if mm. we did. Like I look at places like Dubai, which I know you and your family go to all the time. And I'm like, it, it looks like they've really kind of mastered sharing and, and having that like platform where everyone's kind of rising versus the have and the have nots. And it's not to say that they don't have have and have nots, but no, they, they are the future. Yeah. It, yeah. I'm not saying they don't have have and have nots, but I'm just saying the it doesn't seem like the foundation is the same kind of like here. Yeah. Well, well, at least on the side, you know, it, it, it mm -hmm. is on the side in, 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 in the Emirates, but uh, yeah. um, it, you know, they, they are trying. There's no poverty there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bit of a disparity between like the construction workers they ship them in from like india and uh pakistan mm -hmm. and, you know that region and um and they they don't get paid very well they're not treated all that great but yeah. they're, but they're still better off than they were back home and, and they're, yeah but are they do they live there and I, hey y'all i see you joining in so hello everybody make sure to um say something in the chat room if you can let us uh, know who you are, where you are. I normally have commercials playing right now, but I decided to just um, not do it this time. And we're just chit-chatting, waiting for everyone to get in. Uh, and we're going to go from there. And I know this is a, might be a little quiet day because I do feel like more people are energized, we're energized to vote and checking out what was going on. But uh, either way, we'll, we'll be right in their email boxes tomorrow. So they'll still see it. Now you were saying they, they send the workers from other places and, and all that stuff and they're still better off. I mean, you know, they, they, they kind of have this like dorm set up. So they'll have these big buildings that they live in for six months, 12 months, two years, however long they're there. And um, so I mean, it's, it's, it's clean and habitable, but mm -hmm. hot. it's very hot there in summer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let's get started because I want to make sure that we can just have this conversation be super focused. So what I'm going to do first is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the financial sector and then I'll, I'll bring you in and we can uh, do your part. OK, so I'm going to take off camera and just mute you for a second. Uh, there we go. All right, you guys. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, so you guys, I'm Saria, the creator of Black Wealth Matters educational series, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited because we have a speaker tonight that is a very, very rare commodity, and I think you guys are going to get some great information. And it's one of those careers that um, it's one of those careers that create great financial gains too. But before we start, I want to talk about the financial sector because. Uh, the reason why we're doing this is because we do want to get more people in the financial sector. And we also want to uh, make sure that everyone understands what the different options are. So uh, I'm going to share a little bit about what I do in this space. And then Keith, our speaker, will share a little bit about his as well. So in terms of who we are, who I am and what my company does, uh, even before the company, the genesis of the Black Wealth series was really because um, uh, after the murder of George Floyd, my team and I, we were literally out protesting on the streets every Sunday. And I, I thought, what else could we do? What, what would be our secret sauce that would allow us to uh, make an impact and make uh, some sort of a difference in people's lives that could be generational, right? And that's when I started looking at places like Tulsa and, and studying American history. And you can't study American history without studying slavery, uh, contrary to popular belief. And once I did that, 
I started seeing this big intersectionality between uh, systemic ra uh, racism and poverty. And I started going deeper into it. And I noticed that everything that had a trail also had a present and an ideal future and path that we could take. So I, me and my team, we were looking for experts in different areas. And we started the Blackwell series and we're now we're in year uh, two. So we're on the fourth one, which is technology. But what I want to talk about you guys right now at this moment is the fact of the financial sector being a very viable place for you to have a career and also plan for your future. And, the, you know, the best way to create your future, to predict your future is to create it. So often when we think of careers, we think of what's kind of common. We think of beauty, entertainment. We think of marketing, communications, um, legal, doctors, but finance is a very important career too, right? Now the series is about technology. Today I happen to have a finance major, but I'm always going to bring up the importance of finance because what we've been discovering is systemic racism really functions through poverty. So I'm gonna share really quickly who we are and what we do. And what I would love is uh, throughout the presentation, I'll put up my link if you guys want to schedule some time and uh, chit chat with me. And if there's anything or any resources for Keith uh, to share, please have your pen and paper ready and take some notes. And then I'll also be able to tag it in the chat room. But we do everything on referral. So you guys, I really need to promote this series. So next time when you come, invite some friends and invite your family there's no cost. There's no reason why we can't have thousands of people on this platform. What we're ultimately trying to do is just teach people what wasn't taught in school, but we're also teaching them in a way that allows them to uh, create a business as well. So in finance, we're historically entrepreneurs. We are. Uh, but in our company, we understand that right now time is so hot. I don't know if you guys remember, but if during the summer and during 2022, everyone was talking about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency was the big deal all the time. I haven't heard not a peep about it, right? Because those hot fats can go away, but what stays around is the tried and true, which is just solid financial planning and protection. So people need that planning. People need those services. People also need an effective business model. That's why um, companies like uh, McDonald's and um, our franchises, that's why they do so well, because they're giving people the blueprint. The financial sector has powerful compensations. We've always been a very lucrative industry. And right now, more than ever, people need it. And for those people who are not motivated by money, then we also have a place where you can feel good and, and do a lot of good work. These are some of the statistics about America. And, you know, they say when America catches the cold, Black America catches pneumonia or the flu, right? So all of these these stats are pretty dire, but even with debt, we have credit card debt as a community, but we also have student loan debt when we're, uh, when we're educated trying to get into better situations. 39% 39, uh, 39 of Americans don't have enough to cover emergencies. And regardless of how we wanna think about the world, emergencies or things that we didn't plan for come up all the time. One out of five households don't have enough life insurance. And when we say life insurance, we mean outside of your employer, not inside of your employer. Think of your employer as icing on the cake. If you want to have something you control, have it outside of your employer. More than one third of people will feel an adverse effect if the financial, uh, if the breadwinner of a household passed away. And it goes on and on. And what is ultimately creating is stress. People have a lack of hope when it comes to the finances, to their finances. And right now, inflation is up. And when we think of inflation, we want to say that it's like the government is this, that. It's companies making their prices higher so that they can make more money. And then they say things like, we're raising the price so we can pay our workers, except the workers are robots and they don't have a salary, right? <laughs> so there, there's a lot of different things happening right now, 
But what we're doing is we're just kind of simplifying it, especially on this series. And we're going out to the middle income America. In the black community, the middle income is the tie that lift all boats, right? We really are. And we've historically been that. That's why this series is targeting that. And we want to rewrite the script. Wealth is not things, right? We want wealth to be financial independent. And that's where you're working because you want to work, not because you have to. That's where you're saving, living within your means, building uh, savings and generational wealth for your family. So how we help people do that, you guys, is just through education. Because it doesn't matter how much you make. If you don't have the proper financial education and the coach and all that structure set up, it can go away so quickly, right? You'll miss moments. So our first conversation is education. After that, we perform financial needs analysis, and then we pre present ideas. And the great thing about what we do as financial professionals is you don't need a minimum. You can, um, you can work with us as long as you have a desire. If you have a desire... Or if your mom has a desire or your family has a desire, we'll help with the rest. Now I'm going to do some quick financial concepts and uh, then we'll try to wrap it up. This is my favorite. So take notes on this too. This is important. If we want our money to grow, we really have to understand the formula for growth. And it's called the rule of 72. So how it works is you take 72, you divide it by the interest rate of whatever your investment is making. That's going to give you a number. That number represents uh a years and that years is how long it takes for your money to double approximately so if we start out with ten thousand a day and we're getting two percent let's say from the bank that means 35 years from now we're going to have around 20 and then at age 70 we're going to have um around 40 and then at six percent our money doubling a little more right in 48 years that same ten thousand we'll have over a hundred and sixty three thousand dollars that's better but do we have 48 years? Does the average person in here have 48 years? Maybe not. <laughs> so where can we get a better return faster, right? That's very important. And it's important, it's more important to start now. So often we wait until the student loan is paid off, until we get our debt clear, until we have our 40th birthday celebration, our 35th, our 50th, whatever it is. We're always waiting. And there's a cost to that waiting. So look at this. So these are two people, a 30-year-old and a 40-year-old. They both are only saving for 25 years, the same amount, 2,500 a year, getting a 5% rate of return. Very conservative. After those 25 years, the 30-year-old stops. He takes 10 years and he just lets his money compound and grow. The 40-year-old, he waits until right to the end. At 65, the 30-year-old has over 75000 I'm sorry, $78,000 more than the 40-year-old because he just started early. How does that relate to you? It relates to you because it's more about progress, not perfection, right? So that means do what you can now. And if you're doing it with a person who helps you, that makes it that much better. But my favorite is taxes. I don't know if you guys remember when Barack Obama was running against Mitt Romney, his tax returns, Mitt Romney's, everybody's tax returns were on the internet back then, but Mitt Romney's tax returns were on the internet. Mitt Romney was making about 24 million, paying up around 3.9% in taxes. His whole existence was in tax advantage vehicles. So not only was he earning his money, differently than let's say an employee getting paid W-2 or or things of that nature. He was also, he had also set up his investments where he paid taxes in the beginning and never again. That's a big deal. But in order to have that happen, we got to be able to think about the future. We can't just be, I want my money now. What if I need it? What, you know, how do I get it out? We got to be able to put some away for our future selves. And then not only did Mitt Romney put some away for his future self, he put some away for his future generations. So we're helping people get to that point by helping them ask questions that they need to ask and questions that they might not even know that they need to ask. And we don't just look at investment or insurances. We look at everything. We want to make sure people are paying off their debt. We want to make sure they're protecting their family and they're protecting themselves. And these are some of the companies that we work with, you guys. Um, I hope you guys recognize some of these companies. I love this because these are the companies that most people know about. And that's important because our clients are not all wealthy. And historically, when someone's not wealthy, they get the generic stuff, right? We don't do that. We treat everyone the same. 
regardless. And then there's our opportunity, you guys. Our opportunity is awesome. Whereas Keith and I, we have backgrounds in finance. We're actually allowing people to uh, come into our company and get trained and get developed and certified and then build a career without having to pour yourself out of life and go to school for the next, you know, five years or so, which takes time away from your earning. And why would we want to look at a business on the side? We all know that we need multiple streams of income. We all know this, but adding multiple jobs is hard. We need more money. We don't need more jobs, right? So what's great about our company is we're allowing people to work with us where they get to build equity, but they're building equity and something that can uh, allow them to just have cash flow in the future, right? That's one of the great things about the financial sector. Uh, so you guys, if you want to learn more about the financial sector, I would love to share with you. But in the interest for the sake of time, I would like to hear Keith talk. So what I'm going to do is just give you guys a little bit about his background and then we'll start there. So Keith Price is a former Wall Street executive who currently runs his own multi-strategy hedge fund based in Los Angeles, London, and the Cayman Islands. After earning his BA in economics from Yale and his MBA in finance from the USC Marshall School of Business, he spent the better part of the next two decades in London, New York, and Los Angeles running multi-billion dollar businesses for some of the world's top investment banks. Keith spent 15 years heading various trading desks at Barclays, Deutsche Bank, BMP, Citigroup, where he specialized in turning struggling businesses units into global leaders. And then, by the way, that's also how uh, Mitt Romney uh, created his wealth from taking businesses and turning them into leaders. Uh, Keith currently advises several boards and is active in numerous charitable organizations. His interest in athlete, athletics stems from his own personal athletic career, which included a record-breaking term as a running back at Yale University. So, Keith, let's bring you on back. <laughs> All right, Keith, can you unmute yourself and turn your camera on? Is it possible? Perfect. And then make sure to unmute yourself too. Let's see. Are you unmuted? How about now? Yes, you're perfect. <laughs> All right. So, Keith, let's start out a little bit before we start talking about the finance world. What made you want to go to Yale? Um. I didn't actually, you know, I, I wanted to go play football, like a lot of people in our community, you know, that's, that's the way out, you know, you, you, you shut up and dribble or, or you, you, you dance and, and sing for people, mm -hmm. uh, which, which has is, is been a, a recurring theme throughout my life. Um, and something I think we've talked about before is, you know, acceptable images of black wealth um, in America, um, where, you know, if, if you, you're, you can jump high and run fast and you're you're a millionaire then you're great if you can sing and entertain people and you're a millionaire it's great if you're smart and you know you know a, a lot of americans have an issue with you i'm not saying i'm smarter than anybody or you're smarter than anybody but if 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 you if you acquired your wealth in a manner that they could have but they didn't and there's there's a different different attitude towards towards black people who aren't you know celebrities. So we run into that a lot. But um, I didn't uh, want to go to Yale. What do you run into that a lot? I want to hear more about that. What do you mean you run into that a lot? So you're saying at Yale there were microaggressions or just in general? Oh no no no. In this, is, this is just in my, in my in my professional life and and in, in personal life. Um, even here in LA, I mean you know we we live in the celebrity capital of the world. Um, you know, I have my kids, my kids go to school with a lot of famous people's kids. Um, but, you know, we're not, well, you know, my wife is, is, is more famous than I am, but uh, um, she, she, she could be considered a celebrity more so than me, but, um, you know, we're not movie stars or anything like that. So the, particularly by the school administrations, 
um, treated much differently than, you know, the Jennifer Lopez's kids or, 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 or uh, you know, LeBron's kids or something like that. It's just, you know, um, and, and when, when, we, when we tackled much more academic matters and uh, about, the, about the, the schools, you know, what schools are teaching, um, you know, it, it really was taken out more on our children than on us. And then, um, you know, not to kind of get sidetracked, we, we actually had some, you know, hey, Sal, how come there ain't no brothers on the wall kind of moments uh, <laughs> in school. And yeah, know, yeah. unfortunately for my, my son, that, 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 that ended up being uh, taken out on him by what I consider some white, white supremacist administrative types. Um, but again, you know, if you're shutting up and dribbling, that's great. But if you, you know, if, if you want to impact um, the curriculum and you want to see, like you said, part, part of one of the goals of my organization is to build a farm system, uh, a perpetual ecosystem that produces Sarias and Keiths naturally. So that when I'm, you know, managing director at Citigroup, I'm not the only one there. Got uh, it. Yeah, I'm not the only brown face, so. Got it. Okay. So you graduated from Yale. You went to uh, USC um, Business School. Now, what made you pick finance? Were there, were there finance people in your family? Did, did you have a finance mentor? Because I know you're, you're pretty much um, the same path as Robert F. Smith, correct? I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have similar, yeah, we have similar yeah. paths. He, he, went to, he went to an Ivy League school, a lesser Ivy League school. Thank you, <laughs> Cornell. <laughs> I'm, I'm just teasing. I know. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, but I, you know, but what made you really, pick? I didn't, I didn't really choose finance. I I was always good at I was good, really good at math, and um, honestly, I, I chose economics because oh. I got an A in it. <laughs> you know, I'm like okay, well, and it just kind of wandered along the path, and then. Um, I did like business as, as I, as I went along my career path, you know, I kind of, um, well, after trying to play football, I kind of gravitated towards, uh, um, towards finance. And then I had a really good, I had a really good mentor. I was running the, um, uh, one of the equity desks up in San Francisco, um, for Charles Schwab back during the, the, uh, um, the tech boom. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I kind of got to a point where I was bumping my head on this, you know, managerial ceiling, and she she really encouraged me to go back to school to get my MBA. Ah. Oh. And and I did, and so went to USC. Um, uh, was 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 uh, part of the uh, consortium for the graduate study in management. If, mm -hmm. if any of your listeners have children, or if they're of that age. If they're still young and they're going to go to business school, the consortium is a great program for people of color. Um, I think there's over 20 participant schools. and all the, all, all the schools are in like the top 50 ranked business schools in America. And, you know, it, it, it's a fellowship. So you, it takes care of everything. Didn't, didn't, wow. didn't, yeah, didn't take on any debt in, the, in business school. What? Um, yeah, it's called the Consortium for Graduate Study and Management. Um, great program. You know, okay. talk about things that you can help you get ahead. It was it was so so beneficial. Okay, That's and, then, and then and then Barclays recruited me out, out of business straight out of business school. So after 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 business school, I just I moved to London and uh, started my career there. Actually, okay. And in terms of um, your ultimate goal, what were you thinking in terms of what you would do with finance, or or where? Where did you start out and where are you now? What When you started out in finance, what were you thinking and where are you now? And then I would love to, and then we can go to the history of finance and what you know about that. Um, I mean, I, I wish I could say I had more altruistic intentions as a 27-year-old, you know, but uh, I just wanted to make money. I like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And back then, um, I mean, there, there weren't really many options where you can, you know, you could be under 30 and make high six figures, low seven figure, you know, money. It just was, I mean, now this is kind of before Google and a lot of the app building companies. Uh, 
that you know kind of made made people aspire to be billionaires rather than millionaires so back then kind of the kind of the avenue and um uh it you know i i, I went to barclays um and funny story so i i interviewed with goldman and morgan stanley and back then lehman brothers all all, all the big big top tier banks um and you know i didn't get i didn't get any offers from any of those banks mm -hmm. the only offer i got was from Barclays Capital, which mm -hmm. was a which was a kind of a new investment bank back then. I mean, obviously Barclays was a huge bank, but the investment banking arm was was kind of new. Mm -hmm. And the reason I got that offer was because they were the only they were the only bank that totally stripped nepotism and race and everything out of their process. Oh wow! They we they nationwide, you know, all the business schools they. They pretty much gave you a test and if you finished in the top five percentile globally you got invited to 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 do a weekend in london and if you got on with one of the teams and you, you got a job that's what ended up happening for me so um you know i'm a, I'm a big proponent of meritocracies rather than uh um you know we could talk about on wall street <laughs> nepotism uh, oh, you want a bit later. Uh huh. Okay. So now, so now that you're, so you got in finance to make a lot of money, and now that you've been in finance for a minute, what have you? What's the goal now? <laughs> Is um, it the well, you goal? know, it's it, it it it's funny because even you know climbing up the ranks, um, you. Um, yeah, I think I made managing director when I was, which is kind of the highest level in in the bank. Uh, how old was I? Probably I was in my early thirties, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm about thirty-two, thirty-three. Um, you know, re relatively, relatively early. Um, you know, I had I had achieved all the personal kind of corporate growth, but at some point, I kind of took a step back and said, "Hey, you know." I'm making hundreds of millions of dollars for, you know, these gigantic companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and don't get me wrong. I was, you know, given what we do, we were overpaid um, mm -hmm. for what, for what, what we produce for society. Um, you know, we, we were overpaid. I was probably underpaid compared to some of my colleagues. I would, yeah, I would guess. Sure. I'll, I'll, never, I'll never know. Yeah. Uh -huh. But particularly the last, you know, two or three years, like you mentioned with, with George Floyd, and sorry, sorry about my dogs are barking. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I decided to really kind of step back and, and, and reassess and say, look, I've been making all this money for all, all these others, all these people for so many years. Mm -hmm. And these same organizations couldn't, I don't know if I can curse on here. Couldn't yeah, couldn't, couldn't, care less, couldn't care less about you know us. Nor uh -huh. So how can how can I go about affecting change in the capital markets? Um, because obviously, I mean, there's, and this 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 is kind of the, the the slogan I came up with for 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 our group um, for, for BT Capital. Um, Equity is greater than equality. So our, this is like equity, ah. equality. Equality is wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. I'm glad that we're governed by the same legislation that everyone else is allegedly. Mm -hmm. um, even though we can have a justice system conversation. Mm -hmm. um, however, if we if we're not, you know, shareholders, equity holders in this country as a, as as a, as a group then it really doesn't matter. And that, that, that gap has always been, you know, that, that chasm has been huge for, for, you know, our lifetime, our parents' lifetime, our, our great, great grandparents' lifetime. Yeah. So, you know, we're trying to figure out a solution to close that gap because if we're, if we're not equity holders in this country, then yeah, you know, we'll see improvements our lifestyle is better, possibly, but that generational wealth you refer to is never going to happen if we're not 
if we, we don't own something. Um, Absolutely. You, you never, you pro, you know, you're not going to become generationally wealthy from being an employee. Ever. Uh, and if, if you don't have, one of, one of the problems we're trying to tackle is access to capital. Yeah. And we, kind of what we want to talk about. If mm -hmm. we don't, if we don't bridge that gap with access to capital, then it's, 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 it's such a non-starter for us. I mean, we're all, we're already getting late. We're already late to the ball game. Um, so, it, you know, we really have to, to make some strides over the next few years to, to participate. Um, you know, I feel uh, like also in terms of you were saying the access to capital, I feel like right before that, we also need access to, um, we also need access to a, uh, um, mentorship, leadership, education, because our systems aren't necessarily e putting us on the same equal foot, where even if we did have access to capital, we would be the best person for them to necessarily invest in because we're not, we're not going into technology or things of that nature as a career. You know, it's very rare for us to even be in technology. I've been a speaker for Black Women in Tech, uh, our last speaker was a VC investor and the numbers of us in tech is so small. So even, so I'm, I'm just like finance, which is the other side of tech, which we didn't realize uh, until we did the series. I'm like, wow, we're having a technology series. Why well, I got so many finance people. <laughs> so no, no, I mean, uh, tech, I mean, you're not, you're not going to build tech without getting finance somehow. Yeah. And, and, and that's the problem is if you, you know, uh, I, I can't quantify it off the top of my head, but you know, if if, if you look at what's well, a great example, I, I, I've 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 met so many founders, uh, people of color, particularly black black founders who have come up with great tech ideas or tech inventions, who have just been put through the ringer trying to find seed money, or you know, whether it's angel money, second round money, third round money, or or, or dealing with VCs. It compared to, you know. I think the best, great example is uh, I can't remember her name. The woman up in up in Northern California who built that 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 tech uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, the one who's in jail now, Elizabeth. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. She was in every room. Everyone told her yes. It had no qualifications, but she looked the part. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we can't. I mean, that's that's a cultural, you know, sea change that we have to make. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, I don't have the answer to that, but. That's what we're up against. So what, what we're trying to do is we've tried to take advantage of a lot of the, the, the corporate, uh, I don't know, what's, what's, the, what's the best, I don't want to say it's not corporate welfare, but uh, um, the corporate giving that's, 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 that's come about uh, since George Floyd. Is right? it still here? I don't know if it ever was. Okay, got it. There was, so there was, there was a lot. <laughs> You know, obviously, every every you know, you know Target or you know, Best Buy or whomever wants to appear to to have our best interests in mind, and they want that headline. But I would, if if I had if I had to quantify what, as far as the headline contribution versus the actual realized contributions, I mean, there there were tens of billions of dollars worth of. Uh, of subscriptions or or, or or commitments made by these corporates. I'd be surprised if more than five to 7% of that was actually uh, and distributed in its, what, been a year and a half now? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so, you know, what we're trying to do is um, access some of that. And even myself, I've been on Wall Street, Wall Street for, you know, 20 some odd years and I have a, a in banking, you know, I have a very successful track record. And I can guarantee you if, you know, if, 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 I, if I had a different complexion, um, you know, I'd have 100, 100x, 100 times what, what, what I have now. Um, right. Yeah. Right. As far as, as far as assets under management. Yeah. So, I guess um, so. You know, and, and so our goal is to take that capital um we have we have we have three three kind of silos uh 
the just the trading, uh, the, the fixing. I, 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 obviously, I've built my own models. I, I built this um, statistical arbitrage model, which is just really, um, um, it's been really useful. And it's, 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 it's you can you can use it for you know, cross asset cross asset classes. Um, so that's kind of my role within in the company. Then we have another VC person who is is just tasked to identify you know, black and brown founders and inventors who need access to capital. Um, and then both of those funds will, rather than just enriching our fund and, and reinvesting everything back into our fund, will will take the majority of those proceeds and, and contribute to social justice uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not always relying on other people to to uh, for handouts and and within that within that uh, bucket of capital, we want to build this farm system where we're we're identifying, uh, you know, baby Sarias around the world who want to who have an interest in in math and in mm -hmm. finance, okay. and who, who who so we can identify and kind of nurture them and place mm -hmm. them, you know place them in those all the banks that rejected me you know we could place them in in in, in those banks uh, you know, now we have that network so yeah um, that's that's ideally and i think that's that's a way to to start to tackle it so um, that's we have to you know we have to capitalize more okay but um, so we so that we could just become a perpetually self sustainable um capital provider almost like a bank i don't want to be a bank but okay got it so your way to create some equity, not in the hedge fund world, but just in America is by getting more talented people in the banking system. And in order for that to happen, you feel like there really needs to be an incubator because right now there's not enough incubation. There's no nowhere to grow the baby Sarias and the baby Keats. Is that what you're saying? Well, in, in my opinion, there's not. I could be wrong. Yeah. No, I, I mean, if, yeah. if you don't see it, my, why, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, I, I don't want it to be an anomaly um, for me to exist, right? I, yeah. I want it to, to, to be normal, um, right? And you know, I don't, I, again, it goes back to that that successful, you know, black image. I don't want to, you know, I don't. Yeah, I could, you can see you can see all the gray hairs I have mm -hmm. to this day. Even though I was just on the flight from uh, from London today. Every every time you make a left turn on that airplane, some there's somebody sitting sitting near you saying, "Oh, who do you play for? Or are you you know are you famous?" Or so you might, no, no, dude, that I, I don't play for anybody. And um, yeah, I want that to change. Um, That's what people do when you when you fly. Well, it's because you're you're built like I am large. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I have other friends that happens to um, really aren't my size. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how, I mean, that's kind of yes. how we're trying to tackle it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, and I, you know, obviously, you know, I don't know how historical you want to get. Uh, if you well, tell us about hedge funds. I, so in the financial sector, when I study the market, uh, one of the, the people in the room, she's like, wow. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, when I, yeah, because that was shocking for me too. I'm like, whoa, really? There, number one, I don't, I don't know if I want. I, like, why do you think that my presence requires a conversation? Like, just because I'm here now, I got to be friendly. Like, go mm -hmm. sit down, sir. And <laughs> like, yeah, and and one of the people here is a friend of mine from Chicago. He's a um, he's built kind of like you. He goes. Yes, that happens all the time. When oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize that. That's annoying. Uh, I, yeah. just, I just ignore. I, I ignore them now. I used to. I used to kind of you know, shake have a head. conversation with them. Now I just look at them for crazy. Yeah. yeah, and also go sit down. Yeah. Like I don't have to talk to you. <laughs> Everybody don't have to be friendly. Go talk to that person over there next to you. Yeah, like the 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 ownership and the the. Um, entitlement to just be required to be yeah. polite when that's not necessarily what we get back all the time, right? Yeah, but you know, I like it. <laughs> and, it, and it, it's, and you know what's going on in America. I mean, they don't even want their kids learning what really happened in history. 
They really don't. So, and so, that's why I do the series. That's yeah, why I do this, because I'm like, let me hear it. I mean, I, I can remember events. So I worked on a, a trading floor, right? So there's 500 people, open plan. Um, and I, 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 I can vividly remember one of, one of my sales guys, you know, who, who works on, worked under me. We, I don't know how we got on the conversation, but we're, I think, you know, this is probably around 2014. And, you know, China was really, really expanding rapidly. Um, obviously on pace to overtake us as the number one economy in the world. And, you know, he's, you know, corn, corn fed white boy, grew up in Kansas, hunts for hogs and whatever they hunt for in Kansas. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I like him. He's, very nice, very nice. Uh -huh. um, but, but uh, you know, we're talking about in one one of the asset classes that that, that I managed for some of these banks was uh, interest rates and and inflation. And um, we were talking about the the growth factors, and I, I and we're talking about how China, who twenty years ago was not even on the radar, through the application of cheap labor. Um, you know, took a lot of production from from us domestically and from the Europeans, and was able to make cheap cheap goods with cheap labor. Right? So my point to him was like, well, because you know, I'm not saying he wasn't anti-China, but you know, he kind of already, you know, had this. Sorry if I, I jump around. Had this this, and it, this is kind of an affliction a lot of Americans do that America's special, and that Americans are blessed somehow more so than anyone else and are better and had this so so i point out to them, I was like, well if china was able to 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 achieve this growth over two decades with cheap cheap labor so how did america benefit for centuries with not cheap labor free labor free labor okay i mean the the factor you'd have to apply to our economic scenario we have currently so, i mean it would be an exponential function when there was no labor being paid uh, and we had all these natural resources all, all this agricultural production when the, the rest of the world didn't um so my argument was like well don't you think that's how america got here and you could see his head explode like uh, that's exactly how america got here but when his head exploded was it like a was it was he annoyed? Was he confused about it? What What was there? No, he, he was. He, he his argument was that we were innovative and we were, you know, more more, uh, you know, we had a go get it attitude. You know, stuff you hear at a Trump rally, and and, and when I say no, you, you you know, people work for free for you know two hundred and fifty years, and so you got the leg up. Uh, and, but you know, if, if you know, historically you go back, and that's that's what we're trying to tackle now is, um, I mean, this 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 access to capital and lack of generational generational wealth creation stems all the way back, even even post slavery. I mean, a couple of years before slavery ended, I mean, you go back to the Manifest Destiny days when all Americans were encouraged to move west and. And create your own life. The, the Homestead Act in what, you know, 1862, I guess, a couple years before the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, granted anyone who moved west and was willing to live there for five years, 160 acres of land for free, no cost. So imagine what 160 acres of land 200 years ago would be were handed down to all your, 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 you know, your descendants, how much that would be worth. And for forget that we were only offered 40 acres, <laughs> right. 160 acres and this is in California and Nevada and, and, yeah. Texas, you, know, and you know, Oregon. I mean, this, these are great places to own land. Yeah. And, and then, you know, I mean, I don't know how much of a history lesson you want to get into, but that so much was 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 put against us. The Freedmen's Bank, which was just a hoax to get, you know, free black people to put money into a bank that was owned by a white person mm -hmm. by black people. That money disappeared. Oh, um, yeah. and, and and then then you know we had 
But Keith, before you before you jump off that, what what really is so amazing to me about Freedmen's Bank is the fact that slaves were still saving. And they had better money habits than a lot of Black Americans today, right? They were still Absolutely. saving. I mean, they were slaves and they were still saving and they were able to yeah. put well, on their money. Yeah, the bank they was make, crazy. Hardly making any, any money at all. They weren't making no money. So I don't know if they were bartering with, like, supporting each other financially, but they were able to make some money. Well, they did. They built communities. I mean, and then, you know, I... I I don't know if you ever you speak to, to to the wife. You know, this, she produced uh, or we were producing a uh, Black Wall Street movie. Mm -hmm. um, um, Chadwick Boseman was actually um, he was, oh. he, was, he, was, he was our star. Uh, he's going to be. Uh -huh. uh, and you know, you look at like you know the nineteen twenty nineteen tens to, to early nineteen twenties when you had all these communities. It wasn't just Tulsa, you Greenwood and you had Rosewood, oh, yeah. Yeah. All through the all through the South. Mm -hmm. 50 years fifty years after slavery ended, you had these thriving, thriving communities. And then they were just wiped one summer, two summers, they were just wiped out. They were wiped out and, violently. Yeah, violently. violently and and then again, more legislation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, 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 there was, there was, there's, there were these laws called adverse title laws, and so if, if like in Tulsa, if you drove those, you know, five thousand people away, you could literally just move into their house, and if they don't come back, after, you know, I can't remember how many years it was, you you apply for this adverse title title switches to your name, so. You, you you see that in a lot of these communities. They would just Absolutely. push Absolutely. That makes sense. And uh, imagine that was a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking about the rule of 72 or compound interest. The value just of those assets, let, let alone anything you're making from agricultural or, or you know, your doctor's business. Because those are, you know, people own hotels, banks, you know, doctors. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. The top oh. surgeon in America at the time lived in Tulsa. He was a black man. The yeah. top surgeon in America. He was murdered just like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. One of our speakers was actually the granddaughter. Her grandparents were from Tulsa and they were actually able to get out. And they went to Northern California, some farming communities where a lot of them went. But yeah. they started um, putting pesticides and chemicals on, made a lot of people in the town cough up blood. So now she's an environmental attorney uh, and she went to Harvard. <laughs> so, they, yeah, there's they, a lot of. Yeah. So uh, with hedge funds, where where did it start? What what is exactly the difference between a hedge fund and just the stock market? And where did that start? Because it's so nuanced and different. So um, I don't I don't know the the origin story of hedge funds per se. So mm -hmm. as opposed to all right, so you have what we call real money and and levered money. Um, hedge, hedge funds deal with, with levered money. So a real money fund like a PIMCO or, or Fidelity or, or Vanguard, yeah. mutual funds, that type of thing. So, you know, you take, you take people, put their money in, and they're allowed to go buy assets. They can buy bonds and stocks and try and replicate the S&P 500 or whatever, whatever you, you know, they're, they're investing in. Um, that's real money. Mm -hmm. uh, hedge funds, however, uh, are far less regulated and are allowed to. So let's say, you know, you raise a hundred million dollars in a hedge fund. I can then go to my prime broker and say, okay, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use this strategy to invest in this, these types of assets. Um, but you know, I'm going to borrow against that hundred million. And depending on what that asset is, I can, if I can take a hundred million and buy three billion dollars worth of assets with a hundred million, so that's really levered. And in addition, not only can I buy assets, I can also sell assets I don't own. Whereas real money, you can't sell assets you don't own. So, and that's why you've seen it in the press recently how, you know, you've seen some of these hedge funds try and push down some of these 
the price of some of these shares because they have huge short positions. So that's, that's one of the big differences um, from a hedge fund. And again, and you know, mathematically, the way that works, if you, you know, if you can invest 100 million and make 10% in real money, you're gonna make $10 million. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas if my strategy makes 10%, typically, if I take that 100 million and then turn that into 3 billion and make 10%, then I just made 300 million. I made 300% off my 100 million. So, I mean, that's, that's a very drastic example. Yeah, but I get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that sounds, and it's less regulated, huh? <laughs> so in terms of how our, and, and what, what's going on with the hedge fund world now? Again, the only person I know about is Robert F. Smith. I, in finance, I don't see a lot of people in that space. Is there yeah. a reason why? So, so Robert is, uh, his fund is more of a, a private equity kind of more in a VC space. He, he, he's invested in companies that, and, and put seed money in. And um, uh, obviously they, they've had their issues. I know, uh, uh, but we won't talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's not a lot of us in that, in that space. So yeah, I know there was, when I was at Deutsche Bank, there was one other, uh, there was one other black um, managing director. Uh, he started his own fund. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a handful out there. Uh, mm -hmm. but you're not going to see it. And again, even even Robert F. Smith. You know, he was he was he was funded by you know an elderly white man who gave him okay. you know gave him five billion dollars or whatever he, he two billion dollars. I, I don't know. That oh, exactly. that's very generous. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's in trouble now. Um, but you know, so again, it's always taken that outside kind of push to, to get us going, which Absolutely. is great. And, I'll, and you know, we'll use whatever, whatever tools we can. Absolutely. But eventually I want us to start us, you know, right. I want us to be able to start the new, you know, um, the, the new fund, the new fund managers, the new, um, the new founders, and, and uh, that's I mean that's the way forward. So, Keith, what do you think? What do you think the parents in the room in the virtual space can? What conversations can they have at home to start having kids that aren't afraid of math? Uh, math uh, or aren't afraid of finance, right? STEM yeah. is the area. Okay, yeah. you know. Uh, math is is different. You, you know, math is kind of. You know, I almost think it's genetic. I, I hate to say that, but like, you know, you're either a math person or you're not. I, I, I've mm -hmm. seen very few people really struggle with math, push through, and just become mathematicians. Um, you know, my son was he's, he's, he was decent at math, but he would, just didn't like it that much. Um, I made sure with my daughter because you think there's not that many black people, uh, black women. I mean, it's like so few and far between so i'm you know i've really kind of encouraged her to to stick with the stem subject yeah okay and, and she's, she's thriving but with math it's tough i mean just make it available but with the market stuff you know you make it fun for your kids like uh what let them watch cnbc yeah you, know? <laughs> you know it's just it's it's colorful and you know then they're gonna ask questions but 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 Create. You know, there's a lot of uh, programs out there where you can create um, uh, what, what we call them, like paper portfolios. Where uh -huh. you, so you know, have them look up different companies and and let them put a hundred dollars in. It could be real money or, or fake money. Like I said, you don't have to really do it, but just to get them, mm -hmm. come, so they can yeah. watch it go up and down. And yeah. then, and then like I always tell my kids, you know, you can argue with me all you want, as long as you have a cogent, logical, you know, uh, explanation for what you're doing and have the same, have them do the same thing with these companies. Like, well, why did you want to invest in, in Amazon? Yeah. And yeah, hopefully they have a good reason. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Other than they see the truck out front every day, which, uh -huh. which, which is actually not a bad reason. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's actually a, a good reason. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you think that uh, it starts at home now? For me, I was indifferent. I'm I'm indifferent about a lot of um, 
things. And for me, indifference doesn't mean negative. It no, no. just is indifference. So for with math, I was indifferent. With finance, I was indifferent. And I was like, oh, I can do that. So I didn't, you know, so often people are kind of motivated by passion. I'm motivated by a path. And then I'm not, I, I don't, my emotions don't really have a factor. Mm. Well, <laughs> I mean, it, it's hard. Like investing, trading in particular, you, you really have to strip the emotions out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it you know, you, there's, there's, it's like a syndrome we call it being, you get married to a position. Like, you know, you really like, I love this stock, right? I love mm -hmm. this. And, and your your trade, you know, as a trader is more certain, your trade becomes an investment because you know it's gone down so much, you don't want to sell it. So, you know, you just keep it. Um, uh -uh. And, and you can't get, you know, you have to be very regimented and 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 uh, strict about your 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 your, your stops. So you know, mm -hmm. you, you buy a stock, you're like, okay, if it goes down two percent. I'm out, or it goes down five percent. I'm out. Mm -hmm. You just have to stick to the rules, and it's same thing with with your gains. So you have to have a, you have to have a target um, return uh, for for mm -hmm. each of those stocks or or bonds. Um, mm -hmm. and, and particularly now, the volatility. I mean, given you know inflation yeah. and 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 uh, the the Fed's interest rate hikes, it's it's really become a volatile market, which is great for trading. I love it, but <laughs> for, for for investors, you know, you don't necessarily want to see that. You don't want to see a four hundred one k going up and down, being ten percent in a month. So, right. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's hard. and and again, and that, that also, you know, speaking of interest rates, that also kind of changes the whole calculus of uh, um, you know, getting that capital. You know, like a year ago, two years ago, you know. We were getting free money, mm -hmm. and and now, you know, you know they're just they're they're jacking these these lending rates up, um, and they're going to keep jacking them up uh, according to uh, according to the Fed governors. So um, mm -hmm. it, it makes it, it it makes your 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 level to clear much higher as a, as a leveraged investor rather than yeah. Player. Now, the other question is, you were talking about how we got to get kids kind of like into it. I think a big problem, too, is the adults aren't into it, you know, especially um, in our space. We want to we we work. We worker bees. We work. You know, we want to work and then we want to retire. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that's just a big fairy tale. They tell us to not see what will happen if we didn't have that security. <laughs> but. But you're right. I saw I saw it put uh, very well. I read something today. It said your salary is your employer's drug that like, slowly kills your dreams. Uh. <laughs> you get addicted to having that. Yeah, it is hard. Yeah. So, so what can people do to create more? Um, create more curiosity and passion within themselves as adults. Because again, uh, I feel like Black America, we're so far removed from the finance and tech world that it's just like, it's it's just hard for us to uh, get in there. Okay, it looks like I just lost Keith. I don't know what happened. It looks like his Wi-Fi just uh, fell off. Keith, you here? Can you not hear me? Yeah, okay, what happened? I don't see you anymore. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't see you. Why don't I see you? Hmm. Did you press the little uh, button? Uh oh, now I don't even hear you anymore. Oh, okay, can you see me now or no? No, I hear you, I still don't see you. You guys, if you have any questions for Keith, just put them in the chat room. But what I was saying is um, in terms of, I don't know why I can't see you, but it's the camera on your little, your thing. Uh, you might've gotten a call and it kicked you out. Is that what happened? Um, no, I'm on the computer. Oh, you're on the computer, okay. So the other question is uh, parents, what do you think what do you think we have to do in the black community to get ourselves more 
to get ourselves oh, more, goodness. sorry, to get ourselves more uh, financially quit inquisitive because I feel like that's what's missing. I don't, I don't know a lot of people who are creating wealth who aren't interested in money. Um, I, you know, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know as, as, as parents how to get, uh, I mean, if you're not naturally inquisitive about it, uh, it it's very difficult. Um, you know, you, I mean, but it's something we have to do for survival. Um, because if you're not participating in, in, the, in, the, in the financial markets, you're going to be so far, you know, so far behind. Um, so, you know, I, again, this, I, I could probably give you a list of books like that I read when I first got into the market that are probably good. Um, okay, give us some of those books. <laughs> uh, I, I read, uh, shoot, I'm trying to think of them now. Um, the, the first one I read was, um, why is his name slipping me now? Um, the Oracle of Omaha. Um, what's his name? Gosh. Warren Buffett? Uh-huh. Warren Buffett. Um, but I'm trying to remember the, the name of his book. Was it not the Oracle of Omaha? Because there's a book. It may, have, it, may have been, it may have been. Yeah, there's a book called was, The Oracle of Omaha. It was just, it was just the most simplistic model of how to invest. Uh huh. And it, it, like kind of like you know, we, I said with with the kids, like you know, you're you're, you're buying Amazon because you see the Amazon truck out front every day. Mm-hmm. That that was kind of his thing. Like, look, if there's things you like that you consume and you see your friends doing it. Probably something good to invest in, and that was kind of the premise of, of that book. Um, and there's some more boring books by like Robert Schiller um, that kind of give you better definitions of the capital markets and option trading. Um, uh, there's another one I, it's really slipped in my mind. I, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to email it to you. Uh, okay. To, <laughs> All right. And and Keith, is there any way that people can um position themselves or 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 um get get in, in line, I guess? If what if their company or they have a comp or someone around them that needs uh investors or needs capital, uh how would they go about reaching out to your company? And what is that process? Um, you know, I'll I'll give you my um my email, um, and you know, any, I'm I'm always happy to help. help okay, people. and what's the email? I'll put it in a chat room. Um, it's Keith Price at bt dash cap cap dot com. All right. I mean, you know, and there's no one. You know, there's no one. Keith no one Price formula at- for everybody. I'm sorry. You said Keith that price at what BP? Yeah, yeah. BP at what B, else? At, at BT, like Black Trillionaires. Mm-hmm. Dash cap cap dot com. Okay, perfect. And you know, there's no one formula, but uh, and again, like I said, I'm not I'm not going to lie to you. It's gonna it's it's a it's a harder road for us, um, mm-hmm. particularly if you don't have, you know, a two year track record. Um, you know, that's kind of the, what, what people are looking for, like, a yeah, well, I'm sorry. It's as far as being a hedge fund. Yes. But as far as being, you know, if you have a company or technology that you're interested in raising money for, then you just need to have an idea, some passion and, and hopefully a snazzy deck that can impress people. Okay. Got it. That's, that's okay. what they're looking for. That's awesome. Keep, thank you so much. Um, it, it's been such a pleasure. I don't see any questions. Uh, let me see. Nope. I don't see any questions. You have thoroughly given everyone information. I gave everyone your email address. Uh, I gave them the consortiums, uh, website so that they can have some of their family and friends go to university free. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and we got to get more folks in this, uh, industry. And I love how you're creating this whole incubation system to encourage and, and nurture more people in this industry. I love it. And in, um, in, in terms of your activism, if possible, you and I can talk about that because I think that one of the biggest things that's missing in activism is just 
um, the legal representation. You know, the game is to keep people out of the system and everybody's uh, everybody's trying to defend the dead person. Can we just keep them from being dead? Can we? <laughs> you know, so that's the that's the world that I want to create. So you and I have to talk I, about that. I'm with you. No, for sure. <laughs> All right, you guys. Uh, um, Kiana says thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you guys. everybody. Thank you me. Guys. I appreciate that. And thank you guys for joining us. Uh, thank you, Keeper, giving us your time. We appreciate you. And hopefully people will reach out to you. Uh, I would love to hear from them. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye, guys.